Hello, everybody. Welcome to Nature Live Online. My name is Alistair. I'll be your host for today's show. Thank you very much for joining us today. It's great to have you here. If this is your first time joining us for Nature Live Online, let me tell you a little bit about what it's all about. Nature Live is an opportunity for you to meet and ask questions to some of the people that work at the Natural History Museum in London. Uh, each week we have a different topic and a different speaker and we dive into that topic and it's your chance to ask questions uh, to us today. So if you've got any questions for us during the live show, please feel free to pop them in the chat boxes. We'll try and get through as many of them as we can during the show. So um, we've got a really great topic for you today that I think is going to generate some really interesting questions. And if you're enjoying the show, uh, please consider supporting us and giving us a small donation. It's been a really tough year for the museum, as it has for many around the world, in fact. Uh, so if you are enjoying the show, please uh, consider that. You can find the, do the donate button by the chat box on YouTube, or alternatively, you can go uh, onto the museum's website. Now, today's topic is a really interesting one. It's something that many of us may have actually thought about, um, but we're really going to dive into this and explore it today. We're going to be talking about green technology. So you may have seen things like wind turbines, solar panels, electric cars, that kind of thing. But we're going to be looking at what we're calling the hidden costs of these things. We often see them as the saviors of our sustainable future. They're going to get us out of the, the global problems that we're in, in terms of um, global carbon emissions and the impact that they have on our, on our planet. But as is with a lot of things, there's more to it than that. And we're going to be exploring that today. And helping me to dissect this topic and explore it in a bit more detail is my guest today, Robin Armstrong, uh, one of our researchers at the museum. Robin, thank you very much for joining us today. How are you? Hi, I'm great, thank you. I hope you're good as well, Alistair. So I'm, I'm very good. Uh, looking forward to talking to, the, uh, to you today about this. It's, uh, it's something that I, I just find it really, really interesting. And um, I think it's going to be a lot for, for us to really think about and, and chew over today. So um, we'll, we'll get right to it. So um, before we, we do that, could tell us a little bit what you do at the museum, because your actual area of work is, is one that might surprise people that think of the Natural History Museum as a, as a place for dinosaurs and, and, and furry animals. Uh, and you're not involved in that stuff at all, are you? No, I'm a, a geologist and I'm in the earth science department at the museum um, <clears throat> and my specialization is economic geology or mineral deposits um, and we investigate mineral deposits in the museum because they're probably one of the sites of the greatest geodiversity in terms of the different mineral species we find. My big interest is in economic geology, so where can we find ore? And I do that together from a research perspective. I work with colleagues from the mining industry and colleagues from government in trying to answer those questions. Where do we get our resources from? Mm, so that's, that's interesting. It's so a different angle. You know, you're, you're interested in, obviously, rocks and minerals are absolutely a part of the natural world. Um, but you're particularly looking at how we're using those rocks and minerals and, 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 and the kind of economic value uh, of those things as well. Um, and we're going to see that our future absolutely depends on on these rocks and these minerals that we're going to talk about today. Yeah. And on that note, you know, we could be we we could be here for hours talking about all the different rocks and minerals that we use in in uh, in our lives. But we're going to focus on a couple of key uh, elements today, aren't we? Could you could you tell us what what they are? So we're going to be looking at some of the kind of foundation elements of the green economy. And in red there, we've got lithium, which we all know is in the news at the moment uh, about batteries in particular if we think about what's going on with the opening of the nissan factory up in the northeast uh, which will have a battery component to it general motors or Vauxhall have just made an announcement about a new electric van factory over in ellesmere port which will need that uh, lithium as well and in green we've got copper which is if you like the lifeblood or the art uh, the arteries of the green economy in terms of the transmission of power and how some of the generators actually work in these systems. And then on the bottom row there, just uh, towards the bottom of the periodic table there, we have the rare or not so rare uh, earth elements, um, particularly the ones in pink, which we pulled out. And the one which is a big interest there for us is neodymium. So that's going to go. And on the rest of the table, you can see how some of the tables in gray and some of it's in white and the, the elements which are signified in white are those which we think at the moment are important to this green economy going forwards. Excellent. So these are the ones that we'll focus on and 
you know, we, we talk about um, green technology. We're going to talk about how these are used in, in green technology. But, for, you know, what do we exactly mean by that term green tech? Because we hear it banded around a lot. And I suppose in my head, I think of things like wind turbines and, and electric cars. But I, I'm, I suspect it's probably a lot more than that. So <clears throat> the big thing at the moment is that we have to decarbonize our energy production. Uh, there is no doubt we're facing a climate crisis. We're also facing a, a crisis in terms of biodiversity and how much land usage we've got going on there. Um, but it's everything. So it can be power generation in terms of wind turbines. It can be our transport methods to do with um, our cars, our vans, our trucks. It can be do, to do with how, our, how we heat our houses, you know, heat pumps, for example. You know, we can no longer depend on having gas pumped into our houses for our fuel boilers. So we have to look at new technologies. It's how do we make our current lifestyle less impactful? Mm. Big, big question that <clears throat> and no simple answers as we're going to find out. But let's let's talk about then how some of these metals are used in green tech. So we take something like, say, an electric car, because, you know, electric cars are becoming more and more popular. A lot of people are seeing them as um, a kind of greener, uh, healthier, more sustainable vehicle to own and to run. I think we're only going to see ownership of these cars go up. Um, but how, where, where do you actually find these metals? How are they used? So the big difference, if we want, between an electric car and a internal combustion engine car or an ICE car is that an ICE car is a mobile power station. We stick our fuel in it and petrol and diesel, even hydrogen, for example, I've got loads of energy stored in them. So we're trying to replace that. So we've got these little mobile power stations running around our roads at the moment. Now, what we're going to move to is a vehicle which is an energy storage device. So we're going to charge it up at point A and drive it. And then at point B, we're going to recharge it. So to do that, we need to have a battery and we need to have a a battery that can store a lot of energy comparable should we say to one liter of fuel or how many liters of fuel are in your fuel tank and that's going to need the elements such as lithium and then there's cobalt nickel and a whole smorgasbord of other elements coming along which can also be involved in that so lithium is one of the big ones that's the one we hear about in the news mm. and then we've got the motors themselves so it's an electric drive motor it's not you know we're not cranking something with a combustion engine. So we're going, to, we're going to need some copper for sure. And the amount of copper will be variable depending on the technology that we use and what brand of motor car you buy. And then we've got the, the rare earths, in particular neodymium, because we need the magnets which are going to allow those little motors to drive. So there's a lot of ingredients there that we have to that we have to source. And we're going to have to get more and more of this if we're going to increase the number of electric cars that we're using and, and ultimately get them to replace the, the petrol cars that we're used to to see to seeing on our roads. And if we take copper um, maybe as, as an example, um, getting this copper is is not an easy an easy thing and, and in and that process in itself is using a lot of resources too, isn't it? I mean copper mines are some of the most impressive man-made structures on the planet. Um, <clears throat> They're absolutely colossal. So the image that's just come up on screen now is of Chukimamata in northern Chile. It's one of the world's largest copper mines. Um, you look at the dimensions of that hole in the ground, that's really what it is. It's three and a half kilometers across, it's four and a half kilometers long, and it's almost a kilometer deep. You know, But the average kind of grade of that ore is about 0.6 weight percent. So for example, for every ton of ore, every thousand kilograms of ore, we're probably going to be able to, of rock mass, we will be able to extract about six kilograms of copper. That's crazy. So for a, just to just to repeat that again, for you need a ton of the rock in a mine like this, say a ton of the rock to get just a few, a few kilograms of the metal that you're interested in. A few kilograms of the metal. And if you're lucky, you might be able to pull a few more metals at the same time. But essentially, the majority of the rock that's dug out is waste. Mm. And to get that rock out, 
there's a colossal amount of energy involved. There's the trucks that shift it. There's the explosives that blast it out of the wall. There is the whole process of crushing that rock down so that it can be treated to get the copper out. So if you think about a kind of an average electric car on the road at the moment, for the, from Chukikamata, for example, we're going to need about 14 tons of rock. And that's about maybe somewhere between nine and 10 cubic meters of rock. That's a, a huge volume of rock. And we'll get our 84 kilograms of copper from that if we're lucky. But the number that terrifies me about this process, and this doesn't reflect badly upon the industry or anything like this, it's just how we've done things, is that the whole kind of mining technology, the processing, the dealing with waste, it's all powered by water. So there's energy, electricity going in, but we water is the lubricant of the mining process. So for that 14 tons of ore, which we're going to pull out, that gives us that 85 kilograms of copper, we're going to be using to close to 50 tons of water. Wow. So <clears throat> and it's a phenomenal thing. There's a, there's a and, huge and, area this is, of and this is for one car. This is probably for one car if all that copper is brand new copper, so to speak. That's so incredible. that's a lot of um, rock driving around British roads, basically. Yeah, yeah. When you when you think about it, like, yeah, those those figures are are, are astonishing. Like to to make one car, the amount of energy that's expended to get a, a relatively small amount of metal out of the ground uh, to make one car. Um, yeah, when you really start looking at it, you realize um, what what a challenge it is. And of course, electric cars are just one example. Uh, of green tech that's that's using copper. Of course, there are other ones too. Uh, I mentioned wind turbines is another one that a lot of people will will know, and I imagine that they are they are using this stuff as well. Well, I mean, coppers in uh, wind turbines, you know, these colossal structures that you know they're like flowers popping up across our landscape and seascapes these days. You know, some people like them, some people hate them. You know, they have their merits, um, and. You know, we think around the offshore farms, for example, those turbines are colossal and they they use a whole selection of elements. And it's the same elements again, which are popping up. This time we're not storing the energy, so we're not necessarily got the battery right there. We might have to in the future to make sure the grid can function, but we're still using a lot of copper. So if we take a kind of one of some of the largest um, wind turbines that we see they're using about four and a half tons of copper so it's a phenomenal amount and we think about the rare earth elements which we talked about neodymium in particular which is in the magnets so in the most efficient of the wind turbines the ones which need the lowest amount of maintenance we're using these uh, direct drive which are heavily dependent on these big rare earth magnets and you know that's we're talking around what Ooh, for a big wind farm, it's 119, 120 tons of neodymium in those across the thing in those magnets, and they, it's it's crazy, it's crazy numbers, and it's not you know, it's a green solution, it works really well, um, but it's not always that straightforward because we have to get that neodymium from somewhere, and mm. it's not local, shall we say, it's in far off corners of the planet, and. That ore is always a little bit tricky. It might have other things in it which we're not too keen on it. For example, lots of neodymium ores happen to have quite a lot of thorium in them. So we have to deal with a, a small amount of nuclear, uh, low level radioactive waste that comes up from those as well. That's that's incredible. So you're saying, you know, this the wind turbine, which is, you know, often seen as a symbol of clean green technology, actually in some ways is associated with radioactive waste. Very, I guess depending you know, on where you're getting the, the minerals yeah, from. Relatively in minor amounts of radioactive waste, but it's still radioactive waste and it's still in someone's backyard. It's still out there mm. sitting. Yeah, someone somewhere is living next to that and yeah. having to deal with that. And and we, you know, there's this, we want to, a lot of people say we want to see more of these these turbines out there generating more power. Um, uh, so yeah, you can, you can see where the, the challenges in in terms of how do we actually make this make this happen um so thanks for, uh, very much so far robin if you guys uh, watching have any questions at all for Robin, please do send them in um and we'll we'll try and answer them it's a 
it's a really interesting topic and, and it's it's not got an easy answer, but uh, we'll try our best to, to, to navigate it here today. Um, so, Robin, you, you, you mentioned this uh, a little bit already, that some of the uh, elements that we use in um, in this technology uh, doesn't it doesn't all come from the same place. Now, obviously, we're broadcasting today from the UK. Is the UK um, a good source of, of of some of the the metals that we need to use in in this kind of technology? The UK has got some, you know, it has potential for some of these elements, and we we know that that some of the stuff is coming up. Uh, so you know, it would be interesting. So we we start looking at lithium at the moment in terms of where the production is globally. And we sort of, let's start off from the global scale and then we we'll try and move back into the UK. The majority over the, la over the last couple of years, the majority of lithium, for example, has come from so-called hard rock resources, so from hard minerals in Australia. But the biggest resources for the future are probably in the South Americas, so in Chile and Argentina. And the interesting point here for me anyway is that the majority of the Australian minerals which contain lithium go to China and then they're processed and the material we need to make the batteries is shipped from China to wherever those these gigafactories which every European country is going to build. So there is a need to try and have our security of supply so that we can keep some of this stuff domestically. And for lithium, the UK is blessed, really, because we have the southwest of England and we have other sites within the United Kingdom where our granites, which down, live down there, so our radon producing granites of Cornwall, where our great tin industry emerged from, etc. Um, lithium's there and we can use this. Um, so we, <clears throat> so the point about that is that we can extract lithium domestically in the UK. And on the screen now, we've got two examples of lithium minerals. Um, along the bottom is the chemical formula of those minerals of interest. And we've highlighted the lithium in red. And the point about this is that we've got to go through this process of one, extracting in the case of the, uh, the picture on the right hand side the dark mineral to get that pure concentrate of that mineral which contains the lithium and on the left hand side the rather gorgeous lilac colored mineral is the lithium bearing mineral but what we can see from the formula is that it's not just lithium so there's a whole chemical process or engineering process to extract that lithium from the mineral um, and it involves in this case most of the current technologies, not all of them, involves a lot of energy. And we're going to produce things like fluorine gas. So we have to deal with that as we process. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's quite, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's not a straightforward process. It involves lots of scientists, lots of specialist engineers trying to crack this problem. Is that what they're doing at the moment? Yeah, like we just saw there, the number of other things mixed in uh, together that, and, and you see some of it's waste, some of it might be useful, um, but the point is it's, it's taking energy and resources just to get those raw materials to make the other things that we want to make. And, you know, you, you, you've mentioned there that, you know, we, the, the location of where these elements are is, is really important because I guess, you know, if, if, the, if, the only, so if there's only one place in the world where you can get your, your, your rare element from, and that's crucial for some green technology that we want, you know, we're depending on. Um, that that puts us in a sort of very precarious position, doesn't it? And I, I can see why. I guess it's, it's not just in the UK, but a lot of countries around the world will want to seek. Well, can we find sources close to us that we can access these uh, rare elements? I mean, I mean, that's the big question, isn't it? If we think about Western Europe, we think about how many motor cars we produce and how many people's jobs are dependent in that supply chain upon the production of whether or not it be your Nissan, your BMW, your Seat, whichever car, whichever brand it is, as we electrify these cars, it's mm. going to be a, a totally different menu, as you said earlier, of elements required. And some of those elements just aren't there in the, the tonnages we require in the open market at the moment. So we need to look at those resources. You know, climate change and climate, climate uh, um, <clears throat> environmental damage is, is without borders. 
borders don't matter. Mm -hmm. And the same is about the resourcing of that as well. So everything could come to a sudden stop if country X decided that it wasn't going to export material Y, for example. So mm -hmm. it's not just about the geology. It's about how it impacts on the environment, how it impacts upon the economy, and how it impacts socially upon uh, on what we do. And we, mm. In Western Europe, we can't just keep taking places, keep taking stuff from elsewhere. You know, we have to think about yes, in my backyard, not just in someone else's mm. backyard. That's it, exactly. That I think you know, the fact we're having this conversation right now on our on our computers, which will have elements that were mined on the other side of the world. Um, but we ourselves don't live next to a mine. Um, and most people would say, oh, I, I don't want to. Um, but it's like, well, someone has to, because where are we getting all these these elements from? So yeah, the, the definitely um, a lot there for people to, to think about. If you want to have this kind of um, future, where are we getting those, those uh, materials I mean, that's from? A big, that's, a, that's a really big question answer, isn't it? So it's, it's land use. It's about how big how happy are we to live next to a mine and mines are actually relatively compact to urban development for example um, or agricultural development you know the more land we use the more that impacts upon biodiversity because we we're not giving the living on the natural environment anywhere to be if we just keep expanding 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 mm, yeah. and this is where you know we've got to start to think are you you know whether or not it be mining or whether or not it be energy production how much land do we actually use yeah well let, let, let's talk about that because i know that you know there's there's quite a, a difference isn't there between say the amount of land that a traditional power station might use versus something like a wind farm can you, can you tell us a little bit about that because it's quite when you start to look at it it's, it's, it's quite interesting isn't it i mean the numbers are scary and i think when I mean, we can talk about you know, land area is quite a difficult thing to visualize um and because of that well let's, let's think about a rugby pitch a rugby pitch is approximately one hectare and that happens to be the rugby pitch where the home rugby pitch of the world's greatest rugby team murray field so the the point that we've got to think about is one hectare of ground, so one rugby pitch. And we can talk about, say, Haitian up in the northwest of England in Lancashire is it's a nuclear power station. And we can all go, oh, gosh, nuclear power station. Um, it, it's got a plated capacity, so its maximum generation capacity is around about 2.3, nearly 2.4 gigawatts for two power plants. And they take up the space of approximately a hundred rugby pitches. It's still quite a big area. That's huge, yeah. Yeah, um, and people might have the comments about whether or not they want to live next door to it, or how do we deal with the waste? Now we think about offshore, offshore Cumbria there, and coming into Lancastrian waters is probably the Walney um, <clears throat> offshore uh, wind farm. We talked about it slightly earlier. It generates maximum capacity about one gigawatt. And, but the area of sea that it covers is probably about 7,300 rugby pitches. 7, I mean, so that's not exclusive use of that area of sea. You can still fish between there. You can, you know, there is plenty of environment around there. So the wind farms, they're kind of dual use of ground, which is, is or water or whatever is one way to think of it. But there's still an impact on how we do that. And we still have to wire that up to the national grid. So we have to get all that power off there. The one which kind of the really scary and it's been it's become quite popular as we see around, particularly around the south of England, was solar farms building up. Now we think that in the UK that to produce one megawatt peak capacity we're going to need two rugby pitches. So if we want to generate a comparable peak capacity to the nuclear power station up in Lancashire, we're going to need nearly 5,000 rugby pitches. 5,000? I mean, and that that's, so it's, you know, it's a colossal... These numbers are staggering. It's, it's, the numbers are really difficult to visualize. And the thing about the solar farm, for example, is so I'm probably only going to produce that amount of energy for, if we're lucky, 10% of the time. Well, in the UK, certainly. Yeah, and on a day <laughs> like the this, sunniest country. <laughs> yeah, and on a day like this, where it's either raining or it's sunny, down where I am, you know, 
it does, just doesn't think. And the thing is, it covers the ground. So what is the effect on that on biodiversity? What is the fact effect on that on the natural environment? Mm, yeah. How much farming land are we taking out of the equation? So if we take all that farming land out, where does all that food production come from? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do we have to ship it in from overseas, use more CO2 just to transport it? Yeah, um, yeah, you start to see the the kind of knock on effect and, and the, the fact that, you know, you might solve one problem and then create another one um, in, in doing so. Yeah, there, there is no right or wrong answer. There is, uh, currently, there probably is no zero sum game mm -hmm. on how we continue to live how we do now and how we live in the future. We yeah. haven't reached that technological point yet. Not yet. Um, we've had a, a question coming on YouTube. Um, I don't know if you've got the answer to this one, uh, Robin, but uh, they're asking, what technologies could we consume less of if we need to cut down? Where would you start? Um, have you got an answer to that one? Well, I'd rephrase the question slightly and not say technology. I think the key is reduce our energy consumption. And that's the big thing is how do we use less energy? And the question that we all need to ask, because we can't <clears throat> preach to everyone is, what could we do without? You know, what if you like those conveniences in everyday life, which ones are we willing to sacrifice? Mm. And I suppose so, the answer to that is going to be different for different people. Um, absolutely. You know, people uh, have different needs, you know, and it's um, my washing machine busted by, you know, as it happens. So <clears throat> instead of uh, sticking the school uniforms in for what a, a one and a half hour cycle, I will just have to wash them by hand. Hugely inconvenient, hugely time consuming, but I wonder how much less energy I used by doing that. Mm. And it's those, I'm not suggesting everyone starts hand washing, uh, but the point being is that there's lots of the things in our modern lifestyle which just make it convenient to do. Yeah. So, and and we and because they're convenient, we don't spend a lot of time reflecting on it or thinking about about that, about that impact yeah. necessarily. So that's a good question. Actually, I'm just curious, um, those of you that are watching. Um, let us know in the comments if you if you've um, got things like solar panels or um, anything like that because it'd be quite interesting. To know. Or if you've got an electric car, do you you know and you charge it up at home? Uh, let us know because it's quite interesting to see just how widespread some of this stuff is, and and especially I know thinking about what we're thinking about today, the kind of cost of, of having that. I've certainly thought about solar panels on my house, um, but I don't really have the the roof facing the right way to to make it to justify it. Um, so we can't do that but um i'm sure uh, some of our viewers uh, might have something like that on on the roofs or, or or maybe they've got a wind turbine on a farm or something like that um i remember um uh being up in the orkney islands in the north of scotland and it seemed like every farm had its own private wind turbine because it's never not windy up there <laughs> it's the ideal solution <laughs> <laughs> yeah um brilliant now let's um we're running out of time unfortunately but i do want to talk about um something that certainly one of the tools I think that might actually help us um, get get find some way through this uh, tricky problem and it's the idea of a, a circular economy that's that's a term not everyone maybe has, has heard about what, what do we mean by that? are we talking about about recycling is that the kind of thing do we need to be doing a lot more of that on a, on a much bigger scale recycling is kind of part of the story and it's a it's a huge part of the story but what we're really talking about with a circular economy is an economy that we reuse everything within that economy, all the materials, the, the resources. And it's not just about recycling, it's about designing products so that they can be recycled or have a second life for another purpose. Batteries are a great example. You know, A battery is great, a, a lithium ion battery for a car is great for a car for so many miles but then it doesn't charge as efficiently or so many charge cycles. So we could then use that battery in a household. So for example, if you we were generating solar power, we could collect that power in the battery and it could be stored overnight. So it's how you look at those things. Now, circular economy is conceptually great. And this is what we should ideally move towards, but we don't know how technology is going to evolve. So we don't know what metals are going to need in the future, for example. But the biggest issue with the circular economy right now is it just isn't primed enough. It's not carrying enough material in it for the technologies that we need. 
and cars represent a really good example of that so a rough example so for every <laughs> seven petrol cars that are on the road there's enough copper contained in those probably to produce around about three three and a half electric cars so therein lies the challenge where does that the rest of that copper come from do we have to dig that out and do we have to get it back into the cycle somehow so i mean <clears throat> the simplest solution is use less cars yeah but how many people want to sacrifice their car mm -hmm. and it's all those questions so it's not just about mining we're going to have to do some more of it it's about changing how we think about the resources we use and if you want another kind of glitch term is a uh, the life cycle analysis of everything that we use. So when we pick up our mobile phone is how much gold do we carry around with us? You know, those types of questions mm. and moving them forwards. Yeah. And it definitely looks like, you know, really we should be we should be pressuring manufacturers of the products we use to to build in recycling into the Kind of design of their products. Oh, so you know, for, I mean, I, I guess a, an example that that pops into my mind is a lot of our mobile phones. Um, you as a consumer can't, not without breaking the phone, you can't access the battery, for example, that kind of sealed away. And you think, well, if I could, maybe I could um, keep the phone longer. longer and make it yeah. last longer, and you know that kind of thing. So it looks like you know, product design needs to be sensitive to this sort of stuff. Yeah, so I mean, we we have to think about, and ultimately, you know, if you want the take home message, which we might want to go with, is use less stuff. You know, it's as simple yeah. as that. Um, yeah. I mean, if you want to get on your Twitter and your social media accounts and use loads of energy using that, doing that, but we could turn around and say hashtag use less stuff because that's what it's all about. You know, change yeah. how we live. Yeah. That's yeah. that. That's it. I think yeah. If there's a take-home message, it would probably be that one. We've had a few comments coming through. Um, we've had uh, a one. For, uh, this is a question from Kiara. They're saying concerning electric cars. They're asking what about the environmental cost of the electricity needed to charge them? Really good point there, isn't it? Like, um, it's. So, I mean, that's, that's not the, just making the car. It's like <laughs> okay, I've got to use it, so I need electricity to make it make it run. So, I mean, that's that's something which is. Uh an ongoing debate and it's very difficult to model and it's like if you live in norway electrical cars are great they are almost zero emission impact say you live in another country say i may mean, not want to point any fingers at other european countries they have a colossal co2 impact because their electricity is not generated from renewable resources or mm -hmm. low co2 resources and it's, it's jurisdictionally, very much is jurisdictionally. It depends on where you live at the moment about how friendly your electric car mm. is. Yeah. And, and of course, not forgetting the point we've been talking about today, that even if you have energy, electricity that is 100% renewable, that energy is not guilt free. Because as yeah. we've talked about, there's the cost, there is a cost to making that energy in terms of the equipment. And the it's, a, it's a balance of arguments around about mm. how do we do this and how do we design it to go forward. Yeah. I mean, brilliant. It's, it's been really great chatting to you, Robin. Unfortunately, we've run out of time, but I think you've really um, given people a lot, a lot of stuff to think about. No easy answers to this, unfortunately, but it's definitely, I think, opened people's eyes to, um, to green technology and, and how we, it is important. It definitely forms a part of our, our future, no question. But we have to think about how the scale of that, how we're using it and how we're um, hopefully priming the circular economy, which ultimately, you know, I guess the dream is that you never need to dig anything else out of the ground because it's already there in the system and you're just finding creative ways to, to reuse it. But uh, not quite not quite there yet so some more work to do but thank you so much uh, robin for for chatting to us today it's been it's been uh, really great uh, to to speak to you and uh, all the best for the rest of your research thank you very much Alistair. take care cheers thank you and thank you guys as well for tuning in and watching um i hope you enjoyed that and and found it interesting thank you for your for your comments there um i'm sure there's more uh, that you'll you'll want to talk about around this topic in the uh, years uh, to come as we as we start to really embrace green technology uh, in our futures. Um, so if you enjoyed the show today um, and uh, would like to support the museum, always remember you can 
uh, you can uh, pop over to the museum's website. Uh, any donations you can make are gratefully received. It has been a really tough year for us, and we want to continue to to bring you more of these uh, these talks and chats with our scientists uh, for the future. Um, now, if you enjoyed the topic today and want to explore it in a bit more detail, I'm really pleased to say that the Natural History Museum is going to be part of the Royal Society's Science Summer Exhibition. Uh, this is an annual event, and this year it's going to be entirely online, and uh, the event will go live on the 8th of July, and you'll be able to uh, follow the links. We're going to put them in the, the chats for you so you can see that. And uh, you'll be able to explore this topic in a bit more detail. Um, and as you've seen today, it really is a fascinating one. There's lots to think about. Uh, and you'll be able to really dig into that and find out a bit more about the challenges uh, facing us as we embrace a greener and more sustainable future. But thank you very much for uh, your questions, for your comments today. It's been lovely to have you with us. Next week, we're going to be going on to a completely different topic altogether, uh, looking at, at extreme sharks from around the world. So do join us uh, for that one. But thanks a lot, and we'll see you again very soon. <laughs>